For some context, I'm a female and I'm 20 years old and I recently started my OnlyFans account over the summer to support myself through school. Things were great until I posted my Amazon wishlist. Amazon doesn't release your address to people who gift you items, but third party sellers can. And that's where it went wrong. This is a very frightening story and I felt like it should be shared. One night in late July at around 2am, I took my dog outside to go use the bathroom to do his thing. While he was doing his business, I then noticed a parked car outside of my family home. Now I don't live in the nicest area, so I was used to sketchy neighbors and people around here. I took a closer look when I saw a figure in the car, and I could tell that they were looking at me but I couldn't make out their faces because it was still pitch black outside. Feeling a bit uneasy, I picked up my dog to take him back inside. When I started to move, the car then parked in my driveway. The next morning, I went to go check the mail and there was an envelope addressed to my OnlyFans name with $20 in it, but no note. I was currently still at home with my parents who had no idea about my OnlyFans account, so I didn't mention it to them. A week later, I had moved back to my college town to start getting ready for school, and at this time, I had stopped posting for the time being until I could figure out as to how they got my address. I've watched enough crime shows to know that there was a possibility that I could have been in danger. I live in a duplex with a gated parking lot for reference. One morning, I was planning on vlogging my trip to Target because I was planning on starting a YouTube channel in the near future since OnlyFans felt unsafe. When I got to my car, it had been ransacked and my vlogging camera was missing. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in my car, but I was using it the night before and since I live in a gated area, I didn't think I would be unsafe. I used that camera to film my content and the SD card that was in there had all of my unreleased photos and videos. Anyways, this is where the story gets weird. There are cameras outside in the parking lot so we were able to watch this person break into my car and find the camera and they didn't touch any of the other seven cars on the lot. In other words, they knew which car was mine which suggests that they had been watching me for god knows how long. After they got the camera, they walked around the duplex until stopping near my window. My bedroom faces an outside street and my blinds are broken so it's very easy to see in. I have a curtain, but it doesn't cover my window all the way. Whoever this person was watched me sleep for an hour or so. I have no idea as to why they didn't try to break in, but thank god they didn't. As far as I know, this person then sold the camera to a pawn shop, and since I knew the serial number, the police were able to find it. However, as expected, my SD card was missing. I believe the police are still trying to track them down, but I have broken my lease and moved into a new place, so hopefully... This will keep me safe. I'm not exactly sure as to what took place last night, but this story is one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. Last night, my sleep was cut short by a phone call that came from an unknown number. The ringing of the phone woke me up. I scrambled to the phone and looked at what time it was. It was 3.05 in the morning. I looked down at the blindingly bright screen of my smartphone and thought to myself, Why the hell is someone calling me at 3 in the morning? My decision making was not the best at the moment since I was still under the influence of sleep, but I decided to pick up, and I really shouldn't have. Uh, hello? Who is this? Hi mister. My name is Stacy. This caught me off guard. The person was a small child judging by the voice. I sobered up in a second and perked up my ears. Hi Stacy, honey, are you alright? 
Why are you calling me? He said I can't talk to anyone, or I'll be punished. Badly. Her voice sounded shaken up, and she was crying. Honey, who told you that? Your father? No. The man that took me to his house and said that this was my new home, and that my parents gave me to him. I haven't seen my dad in a year, and I think he is lying. He never lets me go out of the basement. He tossed me a phone today and told me that I can play games. I was, but I was fumbling with it and opened contacts. Your number was the only one in there. At this point, I thought she had been kidnapped, but I tried to remain calm not to frighten her even more. I took my other phone and dialed 911. The dispatcher picked up in a second, and I just said the word, listen. I put the other phone next to the microphone and continued to talk to Stacy. Okay, can you tell me your last name and your parents' number? Um, my last name is Rubio. I don't really remember my dad's phone number. But I do know three numbers. Two, zero, three. I hope that helps. Okay, I'll see what I could do. Just stay on the line with me. The police will be there soon. I was not sure of this. I hope the dispatcher traced the call somehow, since I told him the number. As I was thinking, Stacy's voice came through, now even more scared. He is coming down. I can hear thudding and he's getting closer. You're gonna be alright, honey. A loud bang filled the room and Stacy started screaming. Then on top of all the screaming, I heard this demonic voice say, What the hell are you doing? The voice was deep and unholy. It sounded there was blood rushing out of his mouth as he spoke. Hence the gurgling. There was some sort of commotion going on. And then, silence. I heard the police sirens wailing. Officers entered the house and screamed bloody murder. I dropped the phone and started to talk to the dispatcher. She said that the house was empty, but there was blood everywhere followed by pentagrams. The basement of the house was completely torn apart and there was no sign of Stacy, only a phone, the one she spoke to me on. Officers visited my house and told me everything, how they will call me if anything happens. Also, they found Stacy's parents. She's been missing for over a year, after she was taken from her bedroom in the middle of the night, but she was gone. But on top of all of this, the one thing that worries me is why the abductor had my phone number on his phone and why was I the only one. So about two years ago, a friend of mine had moved into his own apartment. The sofa that was in it was old and worn, so he decided that he would try and find one in better condition. He asked me to help him look for one, as my dad had a van and we would need to use that to transport the sofa. So, we went on Craigslist to have a look at what other people had for sale. We came across one ad that stated a three-seater cream leather sofa, great condition, free to first viewer. There was a picture of it, and it looked in perfect condition. Now the ads had been up for a week, so we had thought that maybe it was already gone, and that they just hadn't taken the ad down yet. So my friend contacted the seller and nearly instantly got a reply saying that they still had the sofa and it was available, if we could collect it. I was a bit weary that it was still available. I mean, a free sofa in perfect condition that had been up for a week and nobody has taken it yet? We thought that maybe there was something wrong with it that could only be noticed when viewing the sofa in person. Anyway, it was a weekend and we had no plans, so we decided that we would go and check out the sofa. My friend contacted the seller back and organized a time and a place to meet up. 
They decided on a local McDonald's car park at 9 p.m. As the seller said that he was in work until 8 p.m. and would need time to get ready after work. The seller said that he would be driving a green Honda Accord with a trailer. So we pulled up to McDonald's at about 8.50 p.m. where there was a load of people around, so we had no reason to think that we would be in danger or anything. At about 8.55, my friend got a text saying that the seller was about 15 minutes away, and he asked him to describe the vehicle that we were in. So my friend described the van that we were in. About five minutes after he had texted the seller what vehicle we were in, an overweight man around 50 years old with a gray scruffy beard and greasy gray hair approached the driver's side window of the van, which was my side, as I was the one driving. He was wearing a plain white t-shirt with what looked like food stains all over it, with black jeans with holes torn in them and dried mud stains all over them, along with a pair of black steel toe cap boots, also covered in dried mud. He knocked on my window, so I rolled it down a bit. You boys here for the sofa? He said in a gravelly voice. It sounded like he needed to cough, but couldn't get it out. Uh, yeah, I said to him. Rob's car is broken down, just down the road, and his phone battery has died. I was with him, and I walked up to get you guys. He's with the car waiting for AAA, but you can come down and collect the sofa off of him. Me and my friend looked at each other, unsure of what to think. Can I get in the van, and we'll go back to Rob together? How far down the road is he? Uh, not too far, but I need to show you where to go. At this stage, my friend pretended to get a phone call. Uh, hello? Yes, uh, no way, really? We'll be right there. Before pretending to hang up his phone, he looked at me and said, We gotta go. My dad needs us to help him with his flat tire. I nodded, knowing that this was a fake call for us to get the heck away from this creepy dude. We gotta go now, but we'll contact you tomorrow about the sofa. The guy just stared at us as I rolled up my window and started to drive away. And me and my friend looked at each other. That was creepy. I got bad vibes off of that guy, my friend said. Definitely, I replied. We decided to drive around the back of the car park to see if we could find out if that guy was really up to something or not. We could see him standing in the same spot where we had left him, and he was on the phone. Put his phone down, and about two minutes after that, a car pulled up with three men in it, and he got in. My friend's phone started ringing, and it was the number of Rob, the guy who was supposedly giving away the sofa. He answered, Hey, can you meet tomorrow and I can hold on to the sofa for you until then? As he was on the phone, I noticed one of the men in the car that had collected the creepy guy was also on the phone. My friend told Rob that he would contact him tomorrow, that he was busy and couldn't talk right now. At the same time that my friend hung up the phone, the guy who was in the car also finished his phone call. At this point, I explained to my friend that there probably was no car that had broken down, and that creepy guy was trying to lure us somewhere, so the guys in the car could do god knows what to us. We drove home and my friend blocked the number of Rob, and we never heard from them again. We reported the ad and it was removed the very next day. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude, so I've never had that much luck with women, and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either, until like the third month of using it, when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. But it wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again, which was odd because bots almost never message more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied. Then I looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but definitely was not a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I'd come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly eight hours by car, away from me. But I had to admit, 
I really did like her quite a bit, and I had been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would make the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she was who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week, and called most days. I just assumed that I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there, though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was, and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she would send me a slew of annoying texts. Admittedly, I had chalked it up to her being all nervous about me coming to see her. But I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing, and it was backed through a series of gravel and dirt roads and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came into an old-looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up, but it didn't look abandoned. Just worse for wear. And Katie's red bug that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent me a smiley face in return. When I get out of the car to go knock on the door, I noticed that someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy, but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and then, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile, and even gave me a kiss which surprised me, and then I followed her inside. We sat down on our couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise, or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad was not here. I still thought she was keeping up the act, and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran to our cars, and when I questioned Katie, she informed me that her dad wasn't there, and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police, and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from the window again, I got a better look of him, and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up, and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions, and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had ran out into the woods, but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did, and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was in the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her, but she never used. I told her it was fine. The man's gone. But she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out, and I'm glad she did. Later that night, I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen, I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was just pissed. I flipped on the lights in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door. And there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked. And I'm glad we locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and found no one in sight. They told Katie and me 
that it'd probably be a good idea to stay somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes, and she was going to stay at her friend's house, and I was headed home. I left a little after Katie did. I was on the phone with my brother, telling him what had happened. My headlights were on, and as I was talking, something caught my eye. That freaking man was standing in the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there, and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Katie, and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever went back to that house alone. Again. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road led the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving along and talking away. Just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that this happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes and turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they're fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of our car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually dart out in front of cars. Not like that anyway. So, for some reason, I decide to check it out. I turn the car around and switch on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I step out of the car and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything. But now it feels like perhaps I've made a grave error. My heart is pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention. But I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly the car horn blasts. It's not a beep 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 that you get if, say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No. This was a long, blaring beep. I walked back into the car and asked my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud, and in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then... He smiled. And waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the heck out of there. And once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was looking for the man in the area that he initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car's headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. 
or they did and just didn't tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. This man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers, for Lord only knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life, as it let my potential killer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this road. All I know is that it runs near Akron, New York at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas with little to no towns nearby. It was the dead of the night and my draggy self had gotten off a long shift and had to drag my butt to my aunt's house since my extended family was expecting me the following morning. About halfway through the drive I realized I was low on gas, which irritated me. My brother told me that he had filled it up the day before, so he either forgot to, or was straight lying. I saw an archaic looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached to it, with gas off next exit, or something like that, painted on it. That seemed a little sketchy, but people do the same thing with fruit stands on the highway, so whatever. I pulled off the exit on some dilapidated county road through dense woods. The whole thing was creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come out running out of the trees with a chainsaw. Anyways, eventually I came to the gas station and realized quickly it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted and the convenience store's roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. I pulled over next to it and checked my gauge. I would probably not make it another half mile before running out, so I called AAA and they said they'd send a truck over. Now I played the waiting game. I left my engine on because when the headlights were off, everything was pitch black and my paranoid self wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station in the middle of a forest in complete darkness. Most of the wait went uneventful, until I sensed movement around the side of the old store, where my lights are pointed. I looked up but didn't see anything more, so I looked back down at my phone. Then, over the sound of the night, I hear someone yell, Hey buddy, come here, in a demanding tone. I look up and I kid you not, there's a dude standing by the old store looking towards me, illuminated by the headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill homeless guy. And I was honestly spooked, but figured he must have been squatting there. Still watching him, I rolled down my window and yelled something like, Yeah, what's up? Still mentally crapping myself. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there, at the first sign of trouble. You got any change? Nah, I don't. Sorry, man. I look up at him. He has this kind of vacant expression and is standing stiff. Then I see more movement. There are heads. About 20 or so heads peeking around trees beyond the man I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly at all, but they are all definitely people, literally just heads staring in my direction from around the tree. I see another guy beginning to walk from around the gas station, and then I turned around and sped off. I got as far away from that place as my tank could carry me, and updated AAA in my location. The driver came back over and filled me up, and I didn't say anything. But after he left, I went to call the cops, so I called the nearest town sheriff department. They said they'd send a trooper over, and I gave them the location. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said whoever was there was gone. But they could tell a large number of people had been living there for quite a while. Blankets, canned food, the usual. The whole situation still freaks me out. 
but frankly I can consider myself lucky that I'll always have such a creepy story to tell. And I'm just glad nothing bad happened. Yeah, and to creepy dudes at the gas station, let's not meet. <laughs>